I'm James Just, and this is Libertarian Counterpoint. And with me today, I have Kalish Merrill, she is running for Hanford City Council, and Nicholas Wildstar, who is running for mayor of Fresno. I want to thank you guys for coming for so far. That's, you know, I appreciate it. So, Nicholas, why don't you tell us, give us a couple of minutes on why you're running for mayor? Absolutely. Well, hello again, everyone. My name is Nicholas Wildstar, and I'm a longtime libertarian activist, <laughs> as James and Kalish knows. I'm also a two-time candidate for governor of California. And uh, I also ran for um, city council in Fullerton, where I, where I used to live. And during the campaign for governor, my wife and I, we had, um, had a few stops in Fresno, uh, thanks to the Libertarian Party of Fresno inviting me down for a few speaking engagements. And uh, we just really loved the city. The energy there was very inviting compared to Orange County, <laughs> surprisingly, uh, considering their history. Um, as well as uh, just the culture of it was different. It's more hometown, I would say. I'm from Wisconsin, so it feels more like home to me, <laughs> uh, especially with the farmland. The agriculture community is big there. Um, lots of small mom and pop shops, and uh, we just love the difference in, in community. So um, June of uh, 2019, uh, we moved there and uh, started our family. We had had our first son chancellor there and um, like I said just wanted to get involved in the community still um, I saw an incident where a young man was um, assaulted by Fresno police his name is London uh, Wallace and he was assaulted by Fresno PD and um, having been someone that's dealt with uh, abuses of authority by police officers myself I felt that is more of a calling to get involved there in Fresno. So um, I chose to throw my hat in the ring, <laughs> so to speak, because, you know, I want to see better leadership. And the uh, candidate running for uh, mayor is actually a former police chief. So uh, since he, I guess, put his hat and name in a hat, uh, I figured why not, you know, um, challenge him for that position of mayor. So I want to give people the opportunity to have someone that's going to represent them versus big government, since the other, the main two candidates that are running, you know, are backed by the major two parties. They have hundreds of thousands of dollars to spend, you know, versus me, I'm basically paying everything out of my pocket. So um, I am wanting to be that true advocate for the community, for the, we the people that the, um, that we the people seek, you know. I want it myself, and I know that the people of Fresno want it as well, and that's why I'm, I've chosen to run for mayor. Well, I spent a couple of years working in Fresno. I happened to actually live in Selma, a little town outside of All Fresno. Right. And oh, you're yeah. for Hanford, so I kind of almost split the difference. Hanford's a little farther away. But so why are you running for Hanford? I actually never got as far as Hanford. <laughs> Selma's kind of as far as I got. It's really easy to go right by it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why don't you tell me a little bit why you're running for the city council of Hanford? Oh, well, uh, because eventually I want to take over the world and force government to leave everyone alone. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as every libertarian wants to right. do, right? Um, well, I, I saw there's at least five different um, issues that I see that needs to be addressed in our town. Um, one of them is reducing regulations. We are, Hanford is very well known for being extremely unfriendly to businesses. We've got probably the most regulations, we've got high fees, whatnot. So um, really what I want to do is go in there and cut a lot of the red tape. As a former business owner myself that was in there, like I, I know a lot of the stories from my other um, fellow business owners. Um, one of the other issues is obviously the homeless issue. We're getting hit by it as well. Um, you know, I think uh, the last thing I read was something like 40% increase in homelessness there in town. So we're having that, those kind of issues. Um, we have a, um, oh, park development uh, through volunteerism. We have an 18-acre lot that's right in my district specifically that's been sitting barren for the last 40 plus years. Um, the town has actual plans, the citizens have plans to actually develop it. City doesn't want to do it, I'm okay with it city not spending city monies on any of that, but we've had a lot of people that want to come out and volunteer their time, donate whatever they can, and get this park developed. City, on the other hand, wants to sell it for housing. 
So it's creating a huge uproar in town. Um, the other issue is public safety, uh, which I think is probably the paramount of what government is supposed to be doing for its citizens, you know, protecting safety and you know, in a responsible manner. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, our fire department has been going understaffed. It's been, um, we've been, uh, we've had a, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been understaffed. Uh, they have not had the equipment that they've needed. Um, so anyway, the, uh, and the, the city has been at odds with them over trying to develop or write, sign a contract over the last few years. Um, and then the last one is getting us from being a general law city over to a charter city. Um, about 25%-ish of California cities are charter cities. Uh, and what that gives us is a lot more autonomy from Sacramento. We have a lot more say in what we do with our tax monies, um, uh, you know, and other municipal issues. Yeah. Well, that's great, interesting. I actually first heard about you when I believe you were helping with the Kings County um, cleanup of Yosemite when the, when the a government shutdown was on, and then I heard you uh, helped save a museum. I think the city was quite, and could you tell us about that? Because I know voluntarism and community service is very important to you and our community, and I know both to Nicholas as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's how we, libertarians actually want to get things done through volunteerism. So can you kind of talk to us about how you, all that kind of stuff came about? Yeah, I, I think that volunteerism, I mean, that's, that's something that uh, it's so easy for any of our local affiliates to go out there and do. It doesn't cost us anything, and, uh, you know, we... Libertarians run on very few funds <laughs> as a party. Um, so it's one of those, you know, it, it, it's fun. It gets you out there in the community, uh, and it puts the name out there in the community as well. And like you mentioned with the government shutdown, um, I was inspired by what was going on with the, uh, the Washington Mall and the cleanup efforts there. So, you know, within a few short days, I got a group organized kind of up and down Central Valley to go and meet up with us in Yosemite. And I have to say, the drive up to Yosemite the state highways were a mess. There's trash everywhere. I'm expecting to see much worse when we get into the park because that's what the media is portraying. Um, we get into the park, it's immaculate. <laughs> 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 we're, so we go and we, we collect the supplies. There's a nonprofit up there, that, uh, it's a climbing organization, they're a nonprofit, and they were supplying all the different uh, equipment that we needed, vests and grabbers and trash bags and whatnot. And so we start to go into the park and we keep driving and we keep driving, and we keep driving. Finally, we just had to stop somewhere and get out and finally start looking for trash. And we were picking up like little tiny wrappers and stuff. And we had the kids with us too, and they're, you know, they get really excited if they found a water bottle or something there. Um, but basically what had happened is once the government shut down, everybody realized that the responsibility was falling to them. And they started taking action with that. Mm -hmm. And then what was more is when we stopped at one of the, um, uh, one of the businesses up there. They said business was booming, better than it ever had been. People were taking advantage of no fees getting into the park, mm -hmm. um, and then all the volunteers coming up there and helping. So uh, there's just this I big influx of people's coming through there. Um, and then uh, to help with matters in the park, um, the businesses were paying for the trash pickups to resume. So they were going around and picking up trash from the dumpsters and uh, that helped out a lot with the cleanups. And then uh, they, they put in porta potties too because when the government shut down, they closed up all the bathrooms. So that's why you were getting um, human feces issues and all that. So they put in porta potties. So anyway, it just showed that people work when government doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. We, we actually see that all around the state. You get to travel around the state and we, we, I know we see all the time where people pick up after their communities, you know, you just, without even being, you don't even need a special event, there's the people who walk in my neighborhood, they went around and just still pick up, you know, trash, or, you know, I do it, when I'm walking, oh, there's a piece right. of trash that's blown in, you know, I live in a weird strange where all the leaves and stuff end up blowing into my yard, you know, I don't even have a tree anymore, and I get a yard full of leaves, <laughs> but along with all these leaves comes trash, and so, you know, you just pick it up, you throw it in the trash can, right. but we don't even think about these things these days, this, this kind of, we have so much, we see all the bad in the world, but we don't see all the good in the world, despite the fact that most of the world is full of people just going out there trying to accomplish their daily lives and doing as best they can. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of why I think it's nice. And have you been in, involved in any, I know with all your moves and a new <laughs> baby, it might be hard. Has there been any new, any new <laughs> community service events you've kind of been involved with recently? Well, uh, not recently. I've kind of had to go at it alone, <laughs> so to speak, because the Fresno, 
um, Libertarian Party has since um, disbanded, unfortunately. So we're in the process of rebuilding it now. So um, like I said, the majority of the, I guess, civil actions that I've done, <laughs> I've had to do myself. So I'll go out in the homeless community and um, give them money, you know, at this time. Uh, what my wife and I have done in the past is we've prepared, you know, like sack lunches with, you know, sandwiches and fruit and um, vegetables and water and just go out there and give it out to as many people as possible. We cooked Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner, you know, and just went out there and gotten involved ourselves just in helping the community. Trying like, to do, yeah, like trying to said, do the best you can of course. with, with I mean, the resources. It takes a community and you got to be responsible. Yeah. And I know you've had a, a long history of, of, of uh, activism, so to speak. You yeah. know, I, your <laughs> activism goes way far back. And so anybody who wants to know about Nicholas's past activism can go to Just his website. Google me. Yeah, <laughs> his activism is past. But I was actually interested. You helped the other day save a museum, I believe it was. Right, yeah. Uh, it was a Carnegie Museum. Um, basically, uh, they were coming down to the wire. Uh, the city put forth like this huge enormous task which took a her I can't speak I can't say <laughs> <laughs> a huge effort it took a huge effort um but a you know if it weren't for just the outpouring from the community people putting in you know 10 12 hour days out there in 100 degree heat uh, we would not have made the deadlines. We were sanding down a wrought iron fence that went all the way around the property. We're painting that, and again, it's 100 and stupid out. Um, there's people that were inside just cleaning things up and making all these different repairs and stuff. But basically, it, it just, um, it, it just seemed very obvious that the city was out there to kind of get them. And just, there was some bad blood. Basically, it's kind of what yeah. it seemed for me from a sitting afar. I'm sitting in Sacramento, kind of watching this and going, "Why is this city a, kind of attacking this museum? It didn't make any sense." I'm sitting here; and it didn't make any sense. The city almost wanted this museum to shut down. Yeah, and you know, we're in a small town, so tensions can really run high <laughs> in small towns. So, you know, you get to know everybody, and uh, even when we're, I mean, we're still big-ish. We're we're about sixty thousand people there, but um, you know the. A lot of people know each other, and uh, there's some button of heads. And uh, anyway, the city doesn't like some of the peoples at the museum, and uh, you know it's just kind of long story short. And they they figured out a way. Uh, well, so the city owns the building. I should back it up. This city was uh, this museum was saved by the citizens back in 1970s or so. Uh, they were going to tear it down, turn it into a parking lot. Uh, citizens came together, they raised the funds that needed to be raised, and they fixed everything and they turned it into the museum. All right. But since then, though, the city has owned it, but the museum has the, the lease rights. And in the lease, it says that they are 100% responsible for all repairs, which, I mean, when you kind of get into it, though, um, you know, that's an old, old building. You know, what incentives do people have to really put that much money into repairs and whatnot if you're not even guaranteed to have that building indefinitely? Yeah, if know? they can take it later on, it's an investment. It's, it's one of the things that happens in lots of these neighborhoods around the thing. You, why invest in something that someone can take away in a, in a year? Yeah, and yeah. so I think that, that may, maybe over the years, you know, that kind of thing, you know, I'm just speculating, mm -hmm. but um, but so s some things fell in disrepair and whatnot, but the city just started coming down really hard on them, wanted to get them out, but then, you know, they're kind of thinking too, like, well, if we close the doors, then we can just reopen it with, you know, some better management and whatnot. Not really taking into account that the museum owns all of the stuff that's in there, yes. all the history, unless mm -hmm. it's on loan by somebody. So that would go bye bye and uh, you know we're we're kind of stuck with trying to start it over from scratch. So yeah, yeah it yeah. seems like a, the, you got a, a city actually kind of not even understanding their own community. It's like our, our representatives aren't really representing <laughs> us anymore, right? They're out of touch more than anybody. Yeah. yeah, which and it comes down to you know who's out of touch the most is police and our, our police accountability. I know Nicholas is a big is a big advocate of police accountability is I describe it Absolutely. as police accountability and so why don't you talk to us about your views on police reform and police accountability wonderful oh, I'd be happy to <laughs> <laughs> I mean because police do have a much needed service in the community and a much appreciated one we do um, 
appreciate the fact that they're out there putting their lives on the lines to protect others. And um, as a citizen, of course, and a financier of that, we just want to see better um, ways of doing that, doing that exactly. Because it seems like there's there's a lot of targeting of specific groups or you know financial class whatever the case may be um, where they're put under the radar more than most and it, if they're law officials themselves they need to be held accountable by the same laws so uh, for instance if you're a police officer and you're wearing a badge again these are supposed to be the bravest individuals in our community so they shouldn't be out there in fear of their lives and responding as such when engaging with um, someone who they believe may be suspected of a crime um, and in most cases it involves a um, victimless crime uh, say for example with Steve, uh, Stefan Clark here in Sacramento where he was suspected of breaking and entering into cars now, even though that's a property issue, um, he was suspected of having a gun. That was more so the reason why they decided to, you know, then open the fire upon him. And sadly, of course, we found out that he only had a cell phone in his hand, um, but it led to his death. And now we have those officers back on the street simply because the district attorney did not hold them account uh, hold those officers accountable for murder um, neither did the di uh, did the mayor uh, so or city council officials etc so it that uh, responsibility unfortunately rolls down to the community to hold our elected officials accountable so since we're paying for them to do that job and we're electing them to do that job it's either we're um, we're sponsoring what they're doing and we're okay with it or if we're not okay to get involved and say something we have stopped being vocal about it as a community I personally <laughs> refuse to do such a thing uh, which is why I live my life in a way to where I let them know hey I'm the one that's paying your salary I'm the one that gave you that badge and that uniform to wear and I should have the authority to take it away. Unfortunately, we the people feel like our hands are tied because we're expecting the police to police themselves. And when the police do bad, or any law enforcement individual for that matter, whether it be a district attorney or a judge, um, who can we call on to hold them accountable? Nobody. You know, we can't call on the federal government because they do investigations like in Orange County where they investigated the um, Orange County jail system for corruption and, you know, um, abuses of authority for over 10 years and concluded there was no, nothing wrong, no wrongdoings. I've been in Orange County jails <laughs> myself, trust me. It's a lot of wrongdoings going on. And it's just awful because... As I said, the responsibility of holding our public representatives accountable um, lies on our shoulders. It's our duty. So that's why I feel like as one of those people who complained about these issues myself, it, it, I need to do something about it. You know, I'm one of those people that believe, hey, don't put the responsibility of someone to get the job done on their shoulders. Do it yourself, you know, so... Hey, yeah, that's why I'm running. <laughs> we've kind of lost, uh, even in Sacramento, we passed, what, 1,100 new laws. And that's just the laws, yeah. the, the regulations that come with that. And so and those all, every single law is, is enforced at the point of a gun, ultimately, right? The, Absolutely. Ultimately, the, a police officer will come and say, you're violating that law. And if you violate that law long enough, they'll take you off to jail and put you in a cage or take away all your, you know, take away your income or whatever it is mm -hmm. to, to force you to comply right. with a lot of this is just now social engineering goals, right? Exactly. It's And one of the things that bothers me a lot is that I see that crimes against policy, if you violate some government policy, is actually created worse than if you actually violate someone else's person. If you watch and punch somebody in the face, you get, you know, maybe go to jail for a night and pay a fine. But if you break a, a government rule or regulations, you can go to jail for 10 years oh, because, yeah. because you had the label wrong on your, on your organic butter, yeah. right? I'll tell you about this, okay? <laughs> Right now, I'm actually on trial, believe it or not, <laughs> for contempt of court. What is this contempt of court? Me videotaping 
in court. And what I wanted to do as a citizen, and again, the financier of these people and their, their job, is I want to make sure that they're doing it as, as we say so. You know, and we need to be able to hold them accountable. So if I can walk in there with some sort of recording device, even though the Constitution says so, and also says that there should be a court recorder present in court to make sure that everything is on record, even though it is not, you know, in our, our present day courtrooms. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people don't enter a courtroom at all. We get a traffic ticket and what's the first thing we do? We just pay it off because we think that's just the easiest way to deal with, this, with the situation. But again, what we're battling here is principle. So if I get pulled over for um, driving without a license or you know, um, not wearing a seat belt, something that is again, a victimless crime, I wanna argue that in court. And I wanna let the court know that I have the right to travel. Um, there's been, um, court cases that have proven such to where it, it can be argued in court, court citations. So if I go in there as someone who wants to represent myself because I can't expect a, a, public, de uh, a public defender to do it for me, you know, because they're abiding by that same law system that the district attorney and prosecutor are, are, as well as the judges. So of course, and the, uh, yeah, they cops, all get their they all get their paycheck from the same yeah, place. They yeah, they all get their paychecks from the same place. So of course, they're going to enforce those same laws, and they aren't going to dispute them in any way, shape, or form. And what I've come to find out is, if you actually challenge their authority and, and say, you know, who do you serve? They'll let you know they don't serve anybody. They have no oath of office. In which case, if they don't, they're either one a traitor. Or, because they have no allegiance to anyone in this country, but, they, but they're applying these same laws that they're telling us to abide by, and they're not abiding by them themselves. So something needs to be done about that, and with the trial that I'm going through right now, I hope that uh, people will do their research to find out more about what's going on because it can happen to any of us. I mean, if I get found guilty, I'm facing a year for contempt of court, and I've been charged with six counts of that so that's six years in jail for recording in court yeah. and and it's an arbitrary law because it's contempt of court it's, but if you walk out in the street and punch somebody in the face you you get what a couple of days at most right exactly yeah and which one of those is actually more worse right, right? which one is, is actually a worse a worse violation it, right. it's and one of the things is, is transparency. If we actually had transparency, and transparency in the government, how the government operates and how they want your museum closed, or what the real reason is, or if the transparency, or why the, you know, the police are actually off, are, are, are not being held accountable, right? Or the transparency in the courtrooms. It's, we, transparency is really what's the way to solve, at least start to solve these problems. Yeah, so we're not gonna yeah. solve these problems, right? There's, you're never gonna solve every problem. Yeah. There's always gonna be another one. But you can actually start to see them, and you can actually start to figure out, okay, how do we get better from here if we have some transparency? Absolutely. Because right now we're not seeing what's going on behind the scenes of the courts, right? We don't know that some judge gets upset because someone's recording. Right. If someone records their video, you know, right? And then now we're going to go through, taxpayers have to pay, what, another million bucks to run through another exactly. thing. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. And how many potholes could we fill with that? How many homeless, <laughs> how many homeless people could we help get off the streets with, with the money we're going to spend prosecuting you for recording a, yes. a public event? Exactly. It, yeah. you know, or how much money could we have, how many homeless people could we have saved with the city being, with the city not being so, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, um, the, uh, it's, the word I want, <laughs> no. yeah. well, the word I'm looking for I can't say on TV is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as we're talking in, we've got, um, how about we talk about some gun control? I was actually at a gun range yesterday for the first time in my life. I'm, I'm an archer, not a, not a gun user. So I was at a gun range for a meeting. And so for me, the whole kind of thing is an ex experience. You know, I'm a believer in gun rights, but I don't, I don't need to own one to, to believe that the Second Amendment is there for us to fight against our, not, a, not for us to shoot a deer, it's for us to shoot a tyrant. 
And that's absolutely. that's the real reason of the Second Amendment. Right. And so, which one he wants to tell? Nicholas has been occupied in some time. What's your view on gun control? <laughs> well, uh, I am a CCW carrier. Um, All right. I'm lucky that in our area, Kings County, um, our sheriff there um, actually advocates for being a CCW carrier. In fact, uh, we were having a slew of like car break-ins and stuff, and they were putting out posts on their social media saying, "Here's what you need to do to start protecting yourselves." You know, putting the responsibility back on the the citizens too like exactly it's going to take us 10 minutes to get there you like they they know the realities yeah. and they acknowledge that and it's great that they are uh, i don't like to say allowing but in how things the are honor, honor. they're allowing us uh, they, they honor the second amendment in the honoring, sport. yes they're yeah. honoring the second amendment and they're encouraging us to you know if you don't have your ccw out uh, or yet go out and get it you know he's very they're very accommodating with it i mean they still go through like the live scan and all that, um, whatnot. But um, yeah, so anyway, we got that. Uh, and we, the Libertarian Party of Kings County, we actually hold our um, meetings at the gun center there, uh, Kings Gun Center. So, and they're great. Like they, they let you use any of their conference rooms for free if you're a nonprofit, which technically we are a nonprofit. Good. So, yeah. Okay, and Nicholas, what's your view on sudden gun control? I know I've heard you speak about gun control before. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you got a couple minutes, we've got about two minutes, so you can kind of. Sure, absolutely. Well, um, Fresno is also very pro CCW with the uh, sheriff there. Unfortunately, the police department, however, is very hostile against people in their possession of weapons, whether it be a gun or a collapsible baton or whatever the case may be, because the definition is so broad and vague. So what I would like to do as mayor of Fresno is actually make uh, Fresno a constitutional carry zone. Um, that way we can get back to the basics of what we're supposed to be here in this country is a, a, a law of the land, you know, which is the constitution, which says you have the right to bear arms. Uh, period. No infringement of that whatsoever. So I want to get cops back to the basics here. I think that would definitely help in the process as well as ending the, um, the possession of weapons violations. In Fresno, that actually accounts for the majority of the arrests, uh, especially of people of color. You know, if you live in a certain neighborhood where you in possession of a gun, then you definitely could be arrested for having that gun. So if we want to eliminate that from happening, then again, we can just make it a constitutional great. carry zone. <laughs> that sounds great. And that is about all the time we have for this particular show. Join us next week. They'll be back for us for the conversation. Right. And we'd like to thank our guests for appearing, for coming so far along. Um, Nicholas, your website is? Wildstar2020.com. And Kalish? You can find me on Facebook, Kalish Morrow for City of Hanford. All oh, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. for mention, information on the topics we discussed, you can go to libertariancounterpoint.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, please click all the buttons. We appreciate it. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you for watching and please remember to love everybody.